I think you can start whenever you're ready, Reverend Ford. All right. Good evening to everybody. We're so glad that you all could join us in this virtual town hall. Of course, we had intended to have our second annual town hall in person, uh, as we did last year with the tremendous turnout we had last year, but coronavirus has changed everything. Uh, so here we are gathering together on Zoom. Uh, we're glad to see all of you who have joined in and, and others who are making their way in uh, through the waiting room right now. Um, now more than ever, uh, the issues and concerns and policy agenda of action for equity matter um, and are imperative as we move through an unprecedented period of isolation, but also one that has really put in sharp relief uh, some of the inequities that we always knew were there, that we were battling uh, in normal times that have been made only worse and have been made only more acute um, in these uh, times of tribulation that we are finding ourselves in. So on behalf of the entire board of a for e and our fearless leader, Kelly P. Easton, our executive director and others who work with the organization, we do want to welcome you uh, to this town hall. Uh, we've got some great content, some great speakers uh, for you this evening. Uh, I have the uh, joy of introducing our first one, uh, which would be Sister Val Young, who is the president of the Forsyth County Association of Educators, which has a mission to be the voice of educators in North Carolina, a voice that unites, organizes, and empowers members to be advocates for education, uh, professionals, public education, and children. So we're gonna hear from her. We have a series of other speakers. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A uh, later on, and then some closing reflections and remarks. We are recording uh, this whole session so that if you miss any part of it for whatever reason, we will be able to share that via social media and otherwise so that you can go back and, and use this as a reference uh, as we move this work forward. Um, so Kelly, unless I forgot something, uh, I think we can move ahead, right? Okay, all right, so Sister Val, so good to have you, President Young, I should say, and if you would uh, go ahead and share some of your remarks on being, nourishing, and supporting our educators. Thank you, Reverend Ford. Um, I'd like to first thank everybody for spending this time and space with us. Um, during the time that we're in this new normal, I think the thing that we forget to say is that you're doing a great job. Um, being the voice of education can be quite difficult, but <clears throat> I've been in education for 20 years. I've been a teacher for 20 years. Last year's assignment was kindergarten, which I never thought I would teach kindergarten, but it was like a full circle kind of thing for me because I ran a childcare center for 10 years before I started teaching. And I realized that um, if you don't get a firm foundation with our children as early as possible, then they're always trying to reach for something that might be very hard for them. So last year was my, what I call my foundational year, and I had to make sure that all my kindergartners were not ready for, were ready for kindergarten, but I wanted to, them to be ready for first grade. So that's how I taught them last year, like they were first graders, because um, my, my past, I've taught first grade for probably 15 years. So it was really my background. So the thing that I think that we're, the problem that we're having is that as educators and as parents, we're having to do a lot more than we had to do before because now you're in the home, you're having to um, educate your child and some of our educators are educating their child plus their classroom. And it's a very daunting um, situation for them. So we were looking at ways that we can support our parents and educators, um, just like we do social emotional learning for our children, we have to do it for the adults also. So I was talking with Kelly and um, Action for Equity and FCAE, we're wanting to do something that um, will be beneficial for parents and all educators, an adult type of um, social emotional um, education. And some things that we have looked at is that um, uh, we have to give ourselves a break sometimes and say, I can't do everything perfect all the time, but what I'm doing is great. 
Um, so some things that I want you to look at, I'm going to put some resources in the chat box, and they're nothing that I created myself. I'm not a life coach. However, um, in my past, um, I have been the person that had to do a lot of um, helping people through hard times. So um, in my past, I was an ordained missionary so that when people have issues at my church, I was the go-to girl. So I couldn't cry and all of that. I had to find ways to vent after they talked to me, vent that pain that I felt from them so that I didn't carry that into my personal life. And some things that um, really helped me was meditation. It's something that I've always taught my children in school, how to meditate and it changed how some behaviors were in my classroom. Um, so I put some um, meditation, some guided meditation, um, some music that you can use to meditate too. Um, I found that when I first started meditating in my head, I was running down a list of things that I needed to do. So I had to learn how to stop doing that and really just be in the moment with what I was doing. So um, I have all these guided relaxing music that you can listen to. And also I find that because I love science, anything that I can sit and veg out on it has to do with science, just intrigues me. And it takes, the, takes me from where I am right now to another place. So I did put our planet on there. Um, it's a resource that you can use to, show you, not only you can do it, but it's a family thing also. And it's interesting because I think a lot of times our children, they don't see um, things different like that that are in our world. We don't all necessarily have the money to take our children on a safari, but we do have the money that we can um, look at, at the area that these animals came from. And it's a way to just have some peaceful time. Um, because I am an early education um, teacher, I love read alouds. And I'm gonna tell you one of my secrets is that I love children read alouds. And I know I probably should listen to adult read alouds, but I think that children read alouds are so much fun. And it's, they, um, a lot of times the lessons that are in a child's story are lessons that an adult needs to learn too. So I put my two favorite, my new one is um, book, story time, and I love it. I also love story time online because it's read by actors. So you have that emotion behind reading. And um, I think it shows also a child what good reading sounds like. So those are things you can do to have some kind of calming activities. Um, I start my day off now with an affirmation. Um, I used to start an affirmation with my children every day. They had an affirmation. Um, and when we had hard times, we would go back to that affirmation. And so every morning I get up and I listen to a positive affirmation. I carry it with me through my day. And if you have an Alexa, they have a positive um, affirmation on Alexa. So every morning you can get up and listen to something positive or create your own or create one as a family. So those are things you can do. <clears throat> I like taking virtual trips. I like taking real trips, but right now I can't go on them. So today I took a virtual trip on the um, largest rainforest canopy. And so the, the, the man that did it walked you through it, but he did it with the camera. So you felt like you were there. Even when he leaned over the rope, I felt how deep it really was. So for me, that was a great way for me to go on a trip. Um, that I didn't have to leave my home. And I think those are great things you can do with yourself and your children. So um, I, I wholeheartedly say that you should take some of these resources. YouTube is a great thing if you use it well. And if you vet them well, um, that you can use to kind of have common time. I believe that every parent should um, go to Go Noodle and let your child just veg out on Go Noodle. They have calming things on there for your child. They have exercise, they have different things. While they're having their fun brain break, you can have your fun relaxing break. Um, every day you should take some time just for yourself. And so I hope that some of these resources really help you. We try not, we're trying our best to do the same, <clears throat> excuse me, for educators. Every Friday we do a Zoom call um, to members so they'll know we're there and we're listening. And we kind of um, have found a camaraderie together that um, not just, we're not just educators, but we're also human beings and we all have the same thing going on. So I hope that helps a lot. If, if anybody here ever needs me, I'm at the FCAE office. You can find us and call me. I'll be there for you. <clears throat> now, it's my honor to introduce a community warrior 
who earned her bachelor's degree from Johnson C. Smith and her master's at Appalachian State. She's been on countless committees. She served on the city council of um, Winston-Salem. And now she's working for us in um, North Carolina as a house representative in District 71. I present to you, hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm not doing it too fast, um, Representative Evelyn Terry, our community warrior, Evelyn Terry, uh, met, um, Representative Terry. Okay, I know she was having some technical difficulties earlier. So that still may be the case. Um, Representative Terry, are you on? Okay, so we'll, we may have to just wrap back around um, to her. But thank you so much, um, Val. And we just, we truly appreciate um, the work of your association and um, everything that you're doing for our educators. Um, and Action for Equity certainly looks forward to um, working with you. Uh, that, like you said, at this time, we're all have to, we all have to step up now more than ever uh, to be educators. Um, and so now I will turn it over to Emily. Um, if Emily could just share some information um, about the work that Action for Equity has done thus far. Hi, good to be with you all. Um, I'm Emily Shutt, the Secretary of Action for Equity. And one um, project I've been working on that I'm really excited that we will get to bring to the community, hopefully sooner as opposed to later, is um, our work with Education Equity Institute out of Charlotte, Educational Equity Institute out of Charlotte, who came in February and with our board and some other um, community stakeholders led an um, educational equity lens paradigm shift training um, that laid the foundation um, for more meaningful equity work, uh, working towards um, second generation equity work. So not just, not the band-aids, but moving towards systemic change. Um, we worked through um, specific details around Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools and talked on structural racism and implicit bias and um, how to move into systemic change. And we are working to train um, action, some action for equity folks so we can take this training out into the community. And really, we just really want to be a resource um, for Winston-Salem Forsyth County so we can um, just shift um, how we are working towards um, supporting our schools. Um, that's what I have to share about that. Kelly, or will you share more? Or Yes, and, and actually, I will, um, I'll pick up at the end. I see the Evelyn Terry. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, this equity lens training is certainly something Again, that we are very, um, we're honored to have the, the, the capacity, thanks to um, our grantors who will recognize at the end, uh, to be able to bring this type of training to move this work forward. Um, it's very important that we do not get stuck with talking about equity, but we just want to make sure that as part of our mission, we are influencing um, our entire community to really move forward. Um, and certainly when it comes to equity and education, and so I saw your box light up a little bit, um, Representative Terry. So I was hoping that maybe we can hear you now. Hi, can you hear me, uh, Carolyn? Yes, yes, perfectly, thank you. Very well, thank you very much. I'm challenged by all of this technology and all of these Zoom meetings and WebExes and what have you. So let me say that the educators and those people who have to work with all of this stuff, I cannot, if I could hug you, I would, but I can't because of uh, COVID-19 and coronavirus. So all I can, all I know to do is say thank you. We owe you so much for what it is that you're doing for our children. Let me quickly say, that education is the, the root and the foundation of who I am. I do a lot of other things that are associated with social justice, equity for everybody. But if a child 
cannot receive a free basic education in America, we haven't done our job. So let me simply say that I am your warrior for whatever it is that I'm capable of doing to move the needle, not only for you, the educators, but for our children. Uh, most recently, I was involved with your school board chair and uh, Dr. Harrison and some people in the community to ensure and work towards getting proper connectivity for our children. And let me tell you just how that happened. I was working with some children from one of the neighborhoods in the city um, who weren't really getting their schoolwork done. And I didn't know why a neighbor of theirs told me that they were sort of idling around. I cooked up a scheme so that he would bring them, and I, sh I guess I should say this because we, we, we were social distance, distancing, but I needed some leaves blown and some little things done in the yard. But I took that opportunity to determine why they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing to catch up with their schoolwork. And I found out uh, after talking to a few of them that they weren't, they, they had the instruments, they had the, the, book, the uh, laptop, notebooks, whatever. They had the, um, but they weren't able to connect. And that triggered my asking a few questions of a few people. To make a very long story short, you probably saw this week where we've at least connected a few of the children and we worked it out collaboratively by just pushing the needle, picking up the phone, calling and getting people involved to let them know that we've got to educate our children. We've got to find a way to ensure that they are connected. And we have enough resources if we put our heads together and keep our cool and not really uh, want to wear a crown uh, by any one of the people involved, but to just make certain that we do the right thing. So with that, I'll simply say, and hey, Ashton, I have to do a shout out because she's been doing some great work in the legislature to try to get some bills out of there that will do um, the right thing for our children. Let me know how I may help. And I'm always here to do it. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Representative Terry. And we definitely appreciate um, all the work that you do um, just earnestly for our community. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so next we have another great um, partner who will share some information. We have Matt Ellenwood with North Carolina Justice Center, the Justice and Education um, Project. So he's just going to share some information in regards to the Leandro case um, and its impact here in Forsyth County. Um, every time we come online to do an event, then we are including uh, more and more information about this because it's, it's important. It speaks to us being able to completely fund um, education. Uh, so, well, I, he'll share more about that. I don't know how complete it would be, <laughs> but certainly give us the boost that we need to be able to invest in the resources um, uh, that will educate the whole child. Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks so much to Representative Terry for those. I feel more inspired than I thought I was going to at 7 o'clock on a rainy night during a quarantine. So that was a really good, uh, I needed that. <laughs> I appreciate it. And hopefully my screen sharing is working right now. I don't know. Yep. All right. How about that? We're getting better at it. Um, so we're going to talk about Leandro some here today. 
<clears throat> and I think it'll lead well into the conversation among some of the legislators about some of the things that are going to happen during this session and, and certainly the number of challenges that we're facing. You know, the stuff that we're going to talk about in regards to Leandro is really, this is a historic, this is a problem with historic roots. It's not just obviously from the pandemic. This is something that's been going on for decades, if not a lot longer. Um, and the, the reports, and you may have heard of the Westhead report that was generated um, in the court proceeding that's been going on for over 20 years. That's really chronicling the nature of the problems before the pandemic and, and what happened from the lack of investment and some of the policy changes we've made in recent, in recent years um, and how we've gotten further away from meeting the minimal constitutional standard of providing all children with access to a sound basic education. So that's before the quarantine. But the same issues are really in effect. Um, you know, the, it's about bringing up standards and ensuring that all children have access to high quality teachers, principals, um, and, and it, it also recognizes that these hardships, whether it's something like this kind of crisis or a hurricane or anything we have, um, falls hardest on our low income communities, on our communities of color, and it falls hardest on children who face additional barriers to learning, English learners, children with disabilities, children who are incarcerated. All of these sorts of pressures that come from an event like this are there for these kids all the time and really just come out and, and are even easier to see in, at a time like this. Um, so we really think the connection here and we're working on trying to talk about it is, you know, why are you talking about court cases and things? Well, this is really a path forward. Or what are we gonna do to make up for all the losses our kids have experienced over recent decades and in they're experiencing now by being out of school? And in our mind, what needs to happen is a really big and bold investment in our schools. If there's anything positive that's come out of this for us, it's that I think we all have a greater appreciation for some of the things about our public schools that we took for granted that, um, you know, just having one kid at home with me for a week and being ready to, you know, drive to a different state <laughs> was, was an eye opening experience to me just of what, te what teachers in our schools are doing day in and day out um, for our kids and, for, and to support us in our work and the things that we do. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people get that there's a lot of work to be done. But I also think, again, there's a lot of belief that our kids have been through a lot and we ought to invest in them. Um, and this is the best path forward for doing so. So I'm not going to go through too much about Leandro. Um, hope, so hopefully some folks know some about it, but it is a lawsuit that's over 20 years old. It was originally brought by low wealth school districts, but you know, it could have included a lot of different districts that were also low wealth or kids from different groups that have been poorly served by our educational system. So it, it, it was brought by these five districts, but it applies to everybody. Um, and establish this, the, the right to, um, that all children have a constitutional right to a, the opportunity to get a sound basic education. Um, and this is based on provisions in the North Carolina Constitution, which is pretty strong on education. Um, there is no federal right to an education or in our U.S. Constitution, so it all comes from this at the state level. Um, the case rolled on for a while. Um, in 2004, um, Judge Manning ruled that the, in order for the state to meet its constitutional duty, it needed to, provide, to staff each classroom with a competent, well-trained teacher, staff each with a competent, well-trained principal. And then and this is a broad one. Really, all three of these are easier said than done. But identify the resources needed to ensure that all children, including, including those who are at risk, have an opportunity to obtain a sound-based education. Fast forward to what's happening now. In 2017, we had uh, Governor Cooper he took over office and that sort of changed some of the posturing in the case where there was some alignment between the state and the, uh, the, the state defendants and the plaintiffs to work together on a plan for meeting the state's on constitutional obligation after this had gone on for so long. Um, the governor created the a Commission on Access to a Sound Basic Education that has a, a bunch of really strong recommendations you can view on their website. Um, the Leandro judge appointed, this is really a big deal for us, an outside independent consultant, Wested, but they also worked with Learning Policy Institute and the Friday Institute here in North Carolina to conduct in-depth in research in education in North Carolina. And they released this report that's very in-depth is definitely right. It's three over 300 pages long. And it, it really addresses a number of issues. I'll just briefly talk, touch on some of those in a second, but it really is sort of a roadmap of, of what needs to happen. And it doesn't have everything. We need to add specifics and, and it needs to be informed more by people who work directly with kids, advocates who are working directly with families who are most adversely impacted in the pandemic. Um, but sorry, in order to 
in order to you know, put a little bit more meat onto the bones they've laid out, but it's a very strong framework for what we need to do to move forward to meet our constitutional obligation. Um, so that's the Westhead report. And then once that was in, in, in January, Judge Lee, who's now the judge in the case, took over for Judge Banning, and is another reason why a lot of this has moved forward to more um, in recent years. Um, he approved a consent judgment that really the long section at the beginning of the Westhead report recognizes the ongoing constitutional violation has a lot about the funding cuts that I'll talk about, some of the changes to student achievement, how we're further away from meeting some of those standards than we ever have before. So that was all adopted into the consent agreement, which also had directed the party as the parties agreed to develop short, medium, and long-term plans to remedy the constitutional violation. Um, some of that timeline has changed. We can talk about that in a second. So even though this is all pretty complicated, the meaning of Leandro is pretty straightforward, that the state has a responsibility to provide every child with access to a sound basic education and that the state is not meeting and has not met during the entire time the case has been going on that minimal standard. Um, so the state's role in education funding is really important, particularly in North Carolina. You can see we pro the state provides 65% of your overall per student expenditures that spend on each child in schools. 24% is local, 11% is federal. That, that federal number is pretty standard across states, but some states will have a lot more emphasis on local funding than we do, but because of our strong provi constitutional provisions and because of the case in some ways, we're in, uh, in just the state's history of commitment to education um, and ensuring that we are able to have some minimal standards across districts, regardless of whether they're, what their ability to pay may be, we have a really lot, a lot of the share of spending falls on the state, and we think that's a good thing for promoting equity as well. Over the past decade, there's a lot, I have a, we have a longer presentation we could share. There's a lot of different ways to show this trend, but we've gotten further away from the national average on all of our spending measures. This one's expenditures per pupil, and you can see it was about seven, we were about 17% below the national average in 2008, and now in 2018-19, we're closer to 30%. So there's been a significant uh, drop off there at a period where we were never that good and we're sort of always behind the national average, but it's much further now. What that translates to on a classroom level, again, you could pick out any one of these that may catch your eye. I mean, to me, I think a big deal is having 36% fewer teaching assistants and teacher assistants. You'll hear from people who taught for a long period of time what a big change that's been big cuts to central office that provide a lot of programs that provide professional development and support um, some of the school turnaround efforts and trainings and things like that. Um, textbooks is obviously huge, 50, almost 57% less on textbooks now. Um, there's a huge backlog in our needs there and our textbooks are old, they're over 20 years old on average. We've completely eliminated funding for professional development and mentors. So those bigger per student cuts translate into major changes at the classroom level. And we've also seen our achievement gaps and our overall student, our achievement gaps have grown between students, obviously, during that period. We've also seen overall um, student performance drop table off on things like the National Assessment for Educational Progress, where we were doing really well in the 2000s, and now we've begun to either stagnate or regress on most of those measures. So let's said report, we'll go in, like, we can send this around in depth, what's in each of these eight, eight critical needs areas. Um, there's one, some of the ones we mentioned around um, qualified teachers and principals. A big section is on high quality early childhood education, how to expand access. There's a lot that goes into that. You have to grow the teacher pipeline and training and all those sorts of things. Um, how to provide supports for high poverty schools, changes to the state accountability system, um, and ensuring the monitoring the state's compliance. We're really interested in ensuring that folks like y'all are people who work directly with kids who are most impacted are involved in monitoring whether or not the state's meeting some of these the, the obligations that are created by the plan it develops in the case. Um, and we think people who are closest to the kids and families who are dealing with these issues are the ones who are gonna know best whether or not we're actually making that sort of progress. Um, so there's a lot there. Um, the, it, it doesn't cover everything. It doesn't cover school facilities needs or things like school integration efforts. Um, but there's a lot in this and a lot, we think a lot baseline kind of necessary way to begin a strong education system, a healthy education system is to have adequate, equitable financial systems that are providing enough resources to kids, who, especially those who historically have not received those resources. So just to translate all that into what it could mean if we actually fulfilled all the recommendations in the West Ed report um, for, for in Winston, 
Um, that would be about $117 million in new funding. So that's a 36% increase. That's state money. 20% um, increase for teacher pay. 220 additional teacher assistants. You'd have a school nurse in every school. A lot of, I always thought we already did uh, before I started doing this work. Couldn't imagine that we would have folks rotating between schools, but we do. In Winston, it's one nurse for every two schools. Um, we would have a counselor for every 250 students, which is the national recommended ratio. The current ratio of Winston is 1 to 366. About. Um, I'm sure local people would know better and check out, so this is what we found. A social worker for every 400 students, that's one that's really out of control at 1 to 11, or 1 to 1,000 right now. Um, school psychologist for every 700 students. Um, again, the current ratio is 1 to every 2,700. And these are all things that are going to be really important when we come back from the pandemic. Those kids are going to have a lot of mental health needs and are going to need these sorts of supports even more than they did before. Um, then another big one, in addition to more for textbooks and supplies, would be NC Pre-K for four year for all eligible four-year-olds. Currently, we have a lot of a lot of eligible children who are being served and, and consistently maintained wait lists. So now, what we're excited about this opportunity because we have that West Ed report as that roadmap. We have some buy-in from different parts of the state government and the governor's commission, the consent judgment means we've committed to put coming up with a plan at the state level on how to deal with this and that the state itself agreed that it's not meeting its constitutional obligation and then it has to do something about it. Um, obviously the pandemic has caused a lot of problems limiting the availability of funding to pay for all this and it may delay the timeline for some of these things and the legislature it'll be up to the legislators to decide um, you know exactly how, how far can we go in this environment right now in the pandemic um, but the, the West Side plan is over eight years. It recommends a phased in approach and that's what we're gonna have to do. And maybe we'll have to have maybe a little less right at the front end than we thought because of some of the lack of revenue that's been, because of the lack of revenue has been created by the economic consequences of the pandemic, but the, the, the constitution is still a constitution. And so over that eight year pit plan, we still have to come up with a way to meet these obligations. Um, and even though it just got harder, I think it just also got even more important to do as if it wasn't enough um, at the outset of this. This is a teaser that we're giving y'all special. Um, our group has not launched yet, but we've been meeting a lot in, with um, education groups from across the state who represent um, the most impacted communities, both geographically um, is, part of, is one goal to ensure that we have representation from across the state, including in the original Leandro counties and also in low-income districts that so serve disproportionate numbers of at-risk kids who are, in, who are being denied their constitutional rights. Um, and we also are representing the different student groups who we found um, are, are more facing barriers that cause them to have their rights violated as well. And I mentioned English learners, children with disabilities, um, people in the early childhood system, folks who are dealing with um, racial disparities in school discipline um, and other racial disparities in terms of the services and outcomes that kids are getting. So we've formed this group that's going to launch soon it's called the, it's the North Carolina Communities for the Education of Every Child. We have just begun to develop our logo and website and that sort of thing and expect that to be put up within the next couple of weeks. Um, but we wanna be able to again, bring in folks like Al who have done this work so well to be part of this type of group. If you're interested, um, we just got this set up where um, you, can, you can try to connect with us at info at everychildnc.org. Since that's so new, just to be safe, um, I've included, um, some of our information as well. You can just email any one of us, especially um, me, me, Matt at ncjustice.org or um, Sarah, who's listening, I'm sure right now won't mind me saying, you could also email her, Sarah M, I need an M in there, I think, Sarah M at ncjustice.org. Um, and uh, any one of us can add you to the list for our group. So um, I really appreciate the time tonight and I'm glad to stick around if there are any questions. I want to thank uh, Matt for that tremendous presentation relative to the Leandro case. Um, we've heard it a lot. And we need to hear it more and more because this really could be a game changer um, and can and should be leveraged as a game changer to hold not only this county, but this entire state accountable for providing that sound basic. Uh, education to all of our students. So thank you, Matt. And I imagine we may have questions relative to the Landry report that we'll deal with during Q&A.
have the uh, privilege of introducing now State Representative Ashton Wheeler Clements, who is the North Carolina State Representative for the 57th District, also sits on the North Carolina Education Task Force. I want to share a few words relative to biography and then turn things over to her. She graduated of UNC Chapel Hill, the North Carolina Teaching Fellow taught school in Durham and Guilford counties, has a master's degree in school leadership from Harvard University. Clement's commitment to education led her to serve as principal of schools in both Rockingham and Guilford counties, where she led the turnaround of one of the state's lowest performing schools. She also served as superintendent of the Thomasville City Schools and was selected as one of the Triad Business Journal's 40 Leaders Under 40, has also been honored by United Way with its Human Rights Advocate Award. She was elected in November of 2018 to the 57th House District, and she has been appointed to the Commerce, Education, K-12, Education Universities, and Finance Committee. So she's all up in the education issues. Great person to hear from tonight. She serves as the House Democratic Freshman Caucus Co-Chair so we are glad to have her here with us tonight to provide some insights as to how things are going at the state level relative to pushing pro-equity educational policy. Sister Clements, why don't you go ahead? Yes, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be uh, with our neighboring education advocates in Forsyth County and especially to Representative Terry who worked so hard in the legislature to advocate for many equity issues, including our public schools. Um, as the Reverend said, my, I'm a state representative now, but I will never adjust to not being introduced as an educator because that's really what my heart is. I taught kindergarten, first and second grades uh, before I was an elementary school principal for eight years. And then my last job was as an assistant superintendent. And I, really went into education um, from a fundamental belief that every child in our state deserves the same opportunity to success as any other child in our state. There is no child more deserving of an opportunity to succeed than any other child. And our traditional public schools where every child, no matter what, has an opportunity to attend is the only place we try to ring true to that. And when we look statistically, we know that there are certain children for whom our traditional public schools have a long way to go to make sure that we are getting our children what they need. And a lot of it is because of what Matt talked about, our resources and our schools are not what they need to be to address the wealth of needs that many of our children have. And so um, my, Passion for our schools led me to run for the General Assembly after I felt like uh, we had moved in the wrong direction in many ways, if you care about our traditional public schools. And uh, recently I was appointed as the uh, Democratic, there were four working groups to respond to COVID-19 and I was appointed as the Democratic co-chair of our working group that worked on COVID-19. So for, those of us who care about our children and particularly our most vulnerable children, this time is so filled with concern because all of the inequities that were existing in education before COVID-19 as each week goes by get worse and worse and worse. And at the same time, we are going into a budget cycle where the, project, the current projection is that we will have $4 billion less in receipts this year compared to last year. And our overall total budget is 24 to $25 billion. So $4 billion is a lot of a percentage in, of, of our overall budget and education's 58 or 59% of that budget. And so for those of us who are needing to advocate at this state level, we are having Already before this happened, we were inadequately serving our schools, which is what the Leandre case is all about. We do not have the mental health, physical health, emotional support, food, basic 
things for our kids that they deserve in our schools. Before COVID-19, we did not have that. And that will continue to be an issue now, except our families are stressed across our state and across our country. And so the needs that were there before are just going to increase. So are our educators. Our educators are stressed because they are having many of them health issues, worries, and trying to do what all of us are trying to do, which is I have an eight-year-old and twin five-year-olds and my husband is at work. So there's a good chance one of them was just in here. There's a good chance one of them will be popping on to join us any, any minute. But um, so our working group, the first task we had was to put forth budget recommendations and a policy omnibus bill to support the emergency needs of our schools. So we worked on school accountability where we waived, we waived state testing this year, which meant we didn't have school report cards, teacher effectiveness, low performing school status. Like there was a lot that trickled down from waiving school accountability. Uh, teacher evaluations and observations. Basically, we um, paused where we were on March 13th. A lot of principals were feeling like they need to go and observe teachers online while they were teaching, which is not in the best interest of anyone. So we kind of paused um, with what we were doing there. Teacher licensure, we wanted people to have an extra year. Um, educator preparation programs, we didn't want anyone to be prevented from entering the field. Those were kind of big issues that we worked through. School calendar was an issue that we worked through and is a hot topic because um, in the house we put forth what we, so educators and school boards were telling us that they wanted to be able to start as early as August 10th. The Senate and the tourism were telling us we were not starting any earlier than August 24th. So in the house we got a compromise to start on August 17th. But then it ended up when we were going through negotiations that there are five remote learning days, uh, which has been, for those of you following along in education, a hot topic. But that's the school calendar. And then came the funding discussion for COVID-19. Now, it's important to know in the COVID funding discussion, the federal government gave the state billion for us it's about four billion dollars that the state is supposed to appropriate to meet the needs of COVID-19 in our state and interestingly the work groups the four work groups put forth budget requests from the house that totaled about 1.9 billion dollars and the Senate's initial plan was to spend $300 million. So that's the difference in what we were starting point to appropriate um, from this total amount that was given to our state to support COVID-19. So we ended up, the, our original house budget request for education was about $599 million. The Senate starting point was $128 million. We landed at about 350 million, so we made um, good progress, but not everything we wanted. The majority of that funding at the state level went to school nutrition. So, for, I mean, I know Winston-Salem has had people out on buses delivering food to kids. Many of our children are depending on the school systems to continue their food needs, and it's a receipt-based organization, so they had not very much decreased income coming in, but the output needed was still a lot. So we did do some significant funding there, some significant funding for summer learning opportunities for kids, and about $45 million for connectivity, so devices and hotspots and things like that. What I would say is it is a starting point, but like many of our big issues that we're dealing with, and I'll end with how I started. Every, I mean, I must have said 300 times, we have to make decisions for every five-year-old in our state. And not one five-year-old in this county or this county, right? All of our five-year-olds have a baseline of what they deserve. And um, when that is true, we, Something like this COVID-19 lays bare 
all of the disinvestment we've had in our system before COVID-19. So we can put some band-aids on here and there, send some school buses out with hotspots, and it's not to say we shouldn't. And how do we push for a system and structure that does not need so many band-aids? And I think that's the work we really are gonna have to dig into at the state level. And so I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer questions whenever the question time comes. And I will put my email address in the chat box because I'm also so happy uh, to hear from people or ideas or questions or anything like that. Thank you. Representative Clemens, we're grateful for the insights you shared and kind of updating us on what has going, been going on behind the scenes and some of the things that we need to be thinking about as we move forward. And so we will uh, entertain any questions relative to your presentation uh, later on during the Q&A. Uh, it's my great privilege, joy, uh, to introduce um, two lovely ladies who are considered friends as well as uh, great leaders uh, in our community as we move this issue of educational equity forward. And that is the chair of our county school board, Ms. Malisha Woodbury. And I believe we also have our superintendent, Dr. Angela Pringle Harrison, on tonight as well. Is that right, Kelly? I believe so. Okay. So we're gonna uh, invite Chair Woodbury uh, to come on, speak for a few minutes uh, under the subject 21st Century Education in Forsyth County with some particular attention to how we think about back to school in light of coronavirus as we look towards the fall and also some very important updates on Ashley Elementary School. The whole genesis of A for E began with action for Ashley. Um, to address the environmental and equity issues that have been going on at the Ashley School for a long time. So Chair Woodbury, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, um, Pastor Ford. And I want to start by saying um, good evening to everyone and thank everyone for tuning in to this very important way to communicate with our community regarding what's going on in education. Um, I would definitely like to thank um, Action for Equity, the staff, um, and of course, from the very beginning with the Action for Ashley initiative, this has been a very revolutionary grassroots um, project that has um, um, focused on how do we bring equity into education, just from the beginning, and it, and it started with you know, Ashley Elementary School as um, a starting point, but it morphed or it has morphed into a community, state, national wide effort to um, manifest equity in our schools from a very sincere place, which I always call grassroots organizing. Um, and I can just recall one of the first meetings that our community had over at um, Della Brook Presbyterian. Um, church, um, of course, through then the leadership of um, um, Brother Eversley, God rest his soul, and just that kind of activism was so very present in the infancy, embryonic even stages of action um, for equity, then known as Action for Ashley. So I am um, forever um, grateful that we have this type of um, holistic resolve in our community that reaches across race and gender and religious differences to come together for our children. Um, so with that being said, I do want to, um, yes, um, Reverend Ford, I, how I do this, um, Reverend Eversley, I just saw your, um, your chat come through and I, I want to um, co-sign on that too. I, I miss his work, but I think his spirit and inspiration live through us all, and he would be very proud of the work that's going on with Action for Equity. Um, but I want to just say a few words and then let Dr. Harrison give a um, more um, poignant perspective on how we will be returning to school because, of course, 
that will be led through um, her staff. But what I will say is it relates to what the school board and most school boards across the state um, are thinking about it as we return to school, um, especially as I was a part of um, a, a response team through the governor's office to, to respond to well, what is it that's happening on the ground that um, the state needs to be mindful of in helping districts to move forward during the crisis and then, of course, um, getting ready for the next school year. And so safety and security, that's like the key piece. And if you've looked at the, the, the new CDC guidelines, if you can't secure and provide safety um, procedures in the schools, then they recommend you don't even open. So safety and security um, is a, a big piece for us. And we mean that from the standpoint of it being a physical and mental um, consideration. And so, you know, I am in full support of the, um, the superintendent coming out with um, ideally a district team to kind of um, help us to plan to move into the next school year to open up school, um, all facilities ideally in, in a very safe way and to, you know, monitor um, the progression of school if, if we're able to open up in um, probably a more um, adjusted format. Um, the, we need to uh, uh, attend to the loss of learning as a school district, just like all the other school districts in the state. And that is um, definitely about our most vulnerable children. So in addition to they were already behind, now they're that much more behind because of the crisis that we will have to think um, more broad about how to help these children catch up, catch up, if that makes any sense. And so um, we know that school systems will not be able to do this in a, a silo or alone. We will have to partner ideally with um, other community organizations and agencies. I know that Dee Dee Adams has already had some soft conversation um, with uh, myself and through the city regarding um, opening up the uh, recreation centers as extended learning hubs. And so we look forward to working collaboratively with um, different organizations to provide extended learning opportunities to try to make up some of this lost time um, lost. And then the last piece that I'll say that I think um, um, Representative Clemens talked about, and I know that Representative Terry talked about, was this universal access, right? Because we know now that um, from here into you know, the near future, we will probably exist in a blended learning environment where students learn um, face to face, ideally, and through technology. And so with that being said, we know that um, internet access in order for um, all districts to fulfill um, each child's constitutional right to a sound and basic education is you know, reaffirmed through the Leandro case, then all students will have to have access to um, the internet and a technological device to learn from. And so um, the school district will continue to um, partner with and process um, with community organizations and elected officials, how do we get um, access, universal access to every child. And I would like to thank um, Kevin Cheshire with the Housing Authority and the Mayor's Office in helping us to at least identify the holes that we had in, um, um, I think it's um, the um, Piedmont Park and Cleveland Homes. And so in those two um, public neighborhood communities, Every family and child should now have access to the internet through broadband, not just the MiFi mobile um, connectivity, but you know it's it's the highest quality of, of, of internet access just through the collaboration of 
um, the housing authority, like I said, Representative Terry, our superintendent, and just different people and organizations through our community making this happen. And I think all of us are committed to this is just a start. And we know we have much more work to do to try to make sure we close the gap with those you know, several thousand students that have not logged on for many different reasons. But what we know is that every child doesn't have access to the internet. So that's the most obvious reason. And, and I'll let Dr. Harrison kind of give more intentionality with, you know, what she's planning to do to make sure that our schools open up um, um, in the next school year. But what I will leave us on as relates to an update with Ashley Elementary School is that um, the, the public knows that there had not been a new traditional elementary school built in East Winston in over 50 years. And Ashley Elementary School um, has had you know, several challenges from an infrastructural standpoint. And I think even in building it where it is currently located, there was some thought that ultimately the school would have to be moved. At least that's what I've heard some say. And so it was, um, you know, uh, I can't say that it was just the work of this board, but even the previous board and the previous leadership out of the superintendent's office to partner with housing authority in the city of Winston-Salem to write the Choice Neighborhood Grant, which ultimately will give us um, better options to build the new Ashley. And the county commissioners were very intentional about, hey, in order for us to um, approve purchasing, uh, uh, allowing the school district to purchase the land to build the new Ashley, they wanted to see if the, um, city would be awarded this $30 million um, choice neighborhood grant. And of course we were excited when the news came that the grant was awarded and therefore it cleared the way for the school system to now purchase the land for the new Ashley Elementary School. And as of um, our last um, work session meeting, which was um, May 12th, the um, Builders and Grounds Committee unanimously voted to for the land to be purchased. And now it will come to our full board meeting um, here in a couple of weeks. And I um, have every um, reason to believe it will unanimously pass from the, um, from the whole board. And I think ultimately what I believe the school board, and I know at least I can speak for myself, I really envision Ashley Elementary being a 21st century um, model of what the whole community school looks like. And I always say that Jeffrey Canada was, you know, 20 something years before his time, because when he created the Harlem Zone um, School District, you know, everyone thought he was sort of crazy. Like, what are you doing uh, uh, from, from the womb all the way to the college perspective in raising a child and making sure that the community can um, support the needs of the child and the family. And so I really hope that our community will advocate for the Ashley Elementary School and the Choice Neighborhood Revitalization of the Northeast um, area, um, specifically um, um, the area over off of Liberty with, with um, the, um, the, the, the community in that area to, to revitalize and to be a place where children and families grow and can prosper and have a good life, um, particularly with a good public education. Um, and so right now, what I would like to do is um, ask for Dr. Harrison to um, provide um, a little update about, you know, her plan or her, she and her staff plan to open up our schools for next year. Thank you, uh, everyone. And thank you, Chair Woodbury. And I always like to acknowledge, uh, especially with our team here, um, the work that was done under Chair Woodbury's uh, first uh, 
tenure as Board of Education Chair with at the Equity Policy. We were able to uh, champion an epi equity policy. Our entire board supported um, the equity policy and hire uh, an equity officer for our district, which was quite um, quite a, 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 a wonderful thing for our district in moving forward. And also thank you, Representative Terry and Chair Woodbury for working to get our children in Cleveland and Piedmont um, access to internet. Uh, we did provide our children with um, laptops and some children uh, with Wi-Fi devices. And we know those Wi-Fi devices cannot begin to give children access to learning the way they need to have access. And so I can say that this experience has certainly uh, demonstrated the, the gap that exists um, with digital learning uh, in our homes. In our, our district, you can see children continuing with um, their learning, their, their standards, uh, uh, all types of science experiments, and you'll see children, many, many children who um, could not engage for a variety of reasons, so we know that this will help. So moving forward, um, we, as I've asked, been asked by Chair Woodbury to share, uh, a lot of our community members feel that we will uh, get on a school bus um, on August 17th, which is our start date, uh, our new start date, and we will take all uh, children as we have in the past to school. They'll leave the buses, go into classrooms as they have in the past and we'll start learning again. And I think most of us realize that there will be some challenges uh, in, in, in doing, uh, having school as we've had it before. In fact, we, we all know that there will be challenges and we are preparing for that. So we've assimilated an internal task force um, to really, um, uh, collect information that's being shared by the uh, superintendents uh, of our state department of instruction by his office also by our triad superintendents task force to open schools and the many many groups that are partnering with superintendents to open schools and boards of education to open schools uh, in a new way and so we have to start talking about what, uh, what's gonna happen when we walk uh, into school on August 17th. What will school look like for us? School will more than likely have many empty seats. A lot of parents have already started to email the board members and myself for opportunities to remain uh, on our e-learning platform. Parents are asking for virtual opportunities and we are, the board has given me permission to pursue that so that some of our parents um, Will, will take advantage of their ability to offer virtual learning to their child at home. That has already started to be the topic for many of our parents. But others will not have that opportunity. Others who desire that opportunity will not have that opportunity due to um, uh, home life situations. And so we will be looking at um, opening school. We will be looking at various aspects of opening school, student and employee health, we have employees, uh, one employee today said to me, I have small children, I just cannot return. And so we'll have to look at what we can do to accommodate our employees. We'll also have to look at facility, uh, safety and facilities. We cannot expect to walk back into schools and, and things, people aren't thinking about filters, uh, common spaces, um, uh, touch spaces, uh, keeping things clean and fresh for uh, children and, and, and free of, of, of different types of, of things. Uh, we're, we're looking at mask, face mask. Um, we'll have parents who refuse to send their children with face masks. We'll have parents who will demand face masks. All of these things must be considered and cannot be taken lightly. How do you transport children? Uh, you usually get about 40 children on a bus. What do you do when you can only put 15 children on the bus? What's the cost of transporting 15 children at a time to their school. Will children be able to attend school every day or they go once or twice a, a week? Uh, what's the um, instructional model gonna look like? I agree with Chair Woodbury. We are going to have to get used to a blended model of learning and that will be our new way for quite some time. My concern is as we move into a blended model of learning, what happens to children who do not have access? What happens to our children who are increasingly uh, falling behind because they do not have access? 
And I'm of the opinion that we are, and I agree with Chair Woodbury, we are of the opinion that universal access is no longer an option, is no longer a, a question, it's, it's a must. And I, and I go back to, to ask uh, you all, everybody on this call or this, this virtual opportunity, what barriers do we place in front of children to attend a, a brick and mortar school? We don't place barriers in front of children. We provide transportation, we provide free resources, we provide support for learning, we provide lunch and breakfast. We have created barriers to learning when we fail to provide children opportunities universally to internet access. They must have access in order to really take advantage of learning or we are denying opportunities to many, many children. The second thing we must do, and I'll press on my staff to, to be working with this, our equity officer is establishing an, an, an engagement task force. We're looking at our reasons children are not engaging in learning. We're gonna to have to have some ground roots, I call them community captains. Uh, we've already mapped the streets and the home addresses of children who are not engaged. We've sent those to the United Way and to our good friend Charlotte over Forsyth uh, Promise. And we're looking at ways to get into our communities and teach our parents how to really work with their children when they're at home in a virtual world. Many of our parents don't have an understanding of the structure that's needed, the discipline that's needed and what's expected. And we must get out there in the community and we must teach our parents. And it's gonna be more than just uh, the school district. It has to be a grassroots effort. It's gonna take our, our, our good uh, pastor forward all of our, our, our ministers, our nonprofits to get to the community and create opportunities for parents to learn how to work with their children at home. Um, this is a new way of, of learning, but I, I tell you, it's just unfair with the barriers that exist and we just, it shouldn't be acceptable. So as we move forward, we'll be looking at opportunities again for student health, employee health, we'll be uh, redefining instruction looking at our facilities and our transportation and trying to determine what's best for our school district as we move forward while we accommodate learning. And I hope I hit the topics that you uh, so desired, um, Chair Woodbury. Yes, thank you, Dr. Harrison. And I think that that concludes our part, um, Kelly and Reverend Ford. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. And so we've, you know, we've, we, we've heard from the beginning of this, um, this call, um, this meeting, you know, now and then as we wrap up towards the end, um, we are continuing to hear the importance of, of us bending together, it's all of us, in order to ensure that we remove the barriers um, for access for our children to receive learning um, as a result of COVID-19. I appreciate Woodbury's, um, Chair Woodbury's comments about the, Charlem, the Harlem Children's Zone um, and the work that, um, that Canada has done there along with his um, entire team. Um, it's a community-wide effort and they are, they, they're not only transforming the lives of children, um, but they're transforming the lives of families and therefore transforming the lives of the entire Harlem community. And so in that same fashion, um, action for equity, that like just from the very beginning, that's, that's where our heart was, is just being able to have the community to be able to bring, to do the work, to bring our community together in order to help support um, our education system. And so as a grassroots uh, organization, we are a policy um, organization. And um, Katie's going to post a link to our policy recommendations uh, um, in the chat. And so, you know, we are accountable to our community, um, but we're very, very careful about staying in our lane because we understand um, that we are, we represent um, the voice. So we seek to represent the voices of those, um, those children who have been adversely impact, impacted by um, just systemic um, structural racism. And so with that being said, we, again, we, we focus on doing, on playing our part, um, but as a coalition, we partner with other organizations. Several of you are here 
Um, I appreciate you for being with us this evening um, because we don't do programs. We don't do programs. Um, we're not trying to do the job of the school district. We can't. <laughs> um, and so we can work together in our community, br bring our community together, work with our parents to ensure that they have an understanding on how they can advocate for their child, beginning with um, strengthening the relationships with the teacher, um, which is why we're very happy to now be really forming a meaningful relationship with the Forsyth County Associate, um, the Forsyth County um, Association of Educators. Um, and we're also partnering with Forsyth Promise. And I am just honored to be able to have the relationship that I have with um, Charlotte. Uh, she really hit, came into our community, hit the ground running, um, mainly by listening. Um, I appreciate her because she understands that, you know, the, we have to utilize our data, um, but she also moves with a sense of urgency, um, but strategically just understanding that we have to connect the dots. And so I um, just shared some of our thoughts about the, uh, the whole child, the whole school, whole community, whole child policy, which is our response to COVID-19. And we'll share some information about that. Um, but it, it's already in alignment with the work that Forsyth Promise is doing. Um, and so without further ado, um, Charlotte, if you can just share some information um, with us about um, where, where you are with um, Forsyth Promise and, um, and the importance of educating the whole child. Well, thank you, Kelly, and good evening. Um, thank you for allowing us to have this space uh, to talk a little bit about the importance of education and how we work together as a community to ensure that every child has an opportunity for success. Uh, for the Forsyth Promise, I mean, we believe that education is a lifelong experience that begins well before a child ever steps foot inside of a classroom and, and will continue well past the time that they graduate um, at commencement. Uh, we feel that it is definitely a right of every child to receive a high quality education. And so we focus on what we call the whole child. And I think that in order to focus on the whole child, we have to take into consideration the fact that it requires a child not only to be educated, but that we're also addressing the social emotional well-being of the child. And, and in saying that, um, we have to uh, make sure that the child is arriving healthy at school. Uh, we have to, to look at whether or not once they arrive at school, they're safe. Uh, we also have to look at, uh, are they connected? Are they engaged uh, with the community? And then also whether or not they feel supported. Um, you know, do they have individuals that they can reach out to, that they can rely on to address their, their needs? And then are they being challenged in the classroom? You know, are they being encouraged to pursue and take part in higher educational learning? Uh, those are the things that um, really we need to be focused on when we talk about helping every child uh, be successful. And then you asked me to also talk about a little bit about community and, and community uh, can be defined differently depending upon, you know, who you're talking to. I know that there's one concept that looks at the boundaries as far as a neighborhood, you know, the geographic locations. And then there's another definition that would speak to social networks and, and that involves, you know, looking at the relationships or networks established of individuals with similar interests and goals. And I would argue that it, it takes it all. I mean, we have to really look at how we bring a cross sector of the community together to address the needs of the whole child. And the only way for us to reach that goal um, for success for every student is by really having a cradle to career mindset. And we have to make sure that we're very intentional in our, in our efforts to eliminate any type of local disparities that exist and also um, make sure that the child or the student has everything that they need to excel in the classroom. 
And so it takes all of us working together, understanding the needs of what exists, but also keeping in mind that it has to be an asset-based approach in that we understand and believe that communities have a lot of uh, ingrained and embedded assets that we can then apply and leverage to the benefit of students and children. And so we have to look at what those assets are. And then once we identify those assets, we utilize them accordingly. But then we also need to take the opportunity to identify what those gaps are. And so once we identify the gaps, we have to then convene and allow our own selves to use the data to really look at how we make informed decisions and create strategies that impact the needs of children. And then once we identify those needs, you know, we come together and we work together intently, understanding each other's different perspectives, and we co-create strategies that really work for children and really move the outcomes for children. And so once we do that, then we have to commit to working together. And so it, it's really holding ourselves accountable. It's not pointing the finger. I always like to say, these are our children and we have to have a vested interest in their success. And we can't do that by working in silos. I mean, we have to come together. We all have a role to play. And in doing so, we come together and we work until we ensure that we have the right type of system to, to allow our children to become successful. And then once we do that, we engage the entire community. I mean, we do it all along through the process, but we engage the entire community because they have resources that can benefit children in order to ensure their success, which then speaks to this concept of whole school, whole community, whole child. It's all of us coming together for the best interest of the children. And I, I feel strongly and passionately that we can do this. It's going to take a lot of work, but working together, we can do this. And so I thank you for inviting me to have this space. And I look forward to working with all of you. There's a lot of work to be done during COVID-19. Uh, a lot of people prior to me have alluded to it on the phone call. But there's a lot of opportunities for us to connect and, and do some good things in the community for our children over the summer. And so I would say that if you're an agency in the community and you want to get vested and help out with the cause, definitely give me a call, send me an email. There's opportunities for you to serve as a mentor. There's opportunities to get people connected as tutors. And I'm quite certain there's some other opportunities as far as, you know, identifying sites within the community to serve as these learning hubs that was referenced earlier. So there's ways for you to connect and serve. And I would just invite you to get involved. And again, thank you for allowing me this space, Kelly. Thank you so much, Charlotte. We, again, just appreciate um, your sincerity around this work and achieving equity. Um, and I did not have Sharon Frazier officially <laughs> on the agenda, <laughs> but I'll be remiss if I just did not at least call her out her name uh, to see if there's anything that you would like to add. Um, I know uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Harrison, our uh, superintendent had mentioned um, the fact that of all the work around equity that has been done um, under uh, Chair Woodbury's leadership. Um, and, you know, we have some powerhouses now with our district, people who I know are really sincerely passionate about equity. Um, and if they weren't, then, you know, I wouldn't say it. So that's the, <laughs> that's the truth. But I know like Sharon Frazier is definitely one. Um, I just really appreciate the, the position that she's in and um, just the sense of urgency that she also works with. Um, so I don't know if you just want to share something. She's our uh, Title I Parent Engagement Coordinator. Um, again, our parents are going to have to really step up. Um, we're going to have to work with our parents. We're going to have to support our parents. 
um, just like I, I, I just know personally um, the struggle, the fight of trying to make sure that your child has everything that they need in order to um, thrive, um, in order to, um, to, to just be whole. And so um, Sharon, if you just wanted to share anything. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, and as Charlotte was speaking, and of course you, Kelly, uh, we've been talking for years. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited that um, this is going to be a challenge that we're up to. There are some of us who, you know, we've been working behind the scenes mm -hmm. and now it's time to step up, you know, come together uh, publicly to collaborate and to, to do this work, um, to also seek out those parent leaders who are in those communities. They exist. Um, some are shy, they're not confident, but they're ready. They're up for the challenge and um, they've wanted to be heard for a long time. So I'm excited, uh, looking forward to working with everybody. So Reverend Ford didn't forget about you. Um, so see my- Thank you, my dear sister. Frankie, Diddy's and <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this again, Willard Bass, uh, Alan, mm -hmm. uh, Miss Terry, so many people that um, I know and have worked with who are up for the challenge. And I don't want to leave our students out. So, in the last couple of years, we have engaged. Um, students, middle and high school students in the parent power sessions, they have a lot to say and a lot to offer. So student voice is critical, critical. I was on a webinar Friday and they do a kid's town hall. So Kelly, we're gonna add that to our list of things to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I, um, it's, you know, these are challenging times, but there's also an opportunity um, for us to just really take hold of the silver lining. And, um, and part of that is definitely working together as a community um, and through the being able to build and strengthen our relationships, um, centering our children um, and, you know, who knows. Um, what can happen. So there are great possibilities. Uh, so I will now take questions. Um, I know, Margaret, you had a question earlier. Um, so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to ask your question. And then, uh, Margaret, after you um, ask your question and, um, and, and get a response, then um, Mackenzie, if you're on, I know you had a question as well. So I will give you that opportunity. Thank you, Kelly. My question has already been answered by Katie. Uh, I was concerned about the proposed Brunson Elementary School site. Uh, an article last year alerted us that there was uh, contamination of the soil in hydrocarbons and industrial solvents. Um, and I had reached out to the school board several times previously, heard nothing back, and I wrote them a letter last week and sent an email and still hadn't heard. So I just wanted to make sure that you folks were aware that this, um, according to the newspaper article anyway, that it was a brownfield site. And Katie has informed me that yes, you are aware and you're waiting for the science on it. My uh, husband is a researcher and he is providing expert testimony in a series of um, legal uh, trial going on in California right at this time and it's with these, same chemicals. He was one of the earlier researchers. So I know a lot about it. And so I'm very concerned that if a decision is made for that site, uh, that everyone is aware 
of the possible liabilities of that for the health of our young people. Because to me, safety starts even in their school ground where they're going to be playing, in their drinking water, every bit of it. It's not just the classroom. I want them to have equal opportunities in Forsyth County that we would expect. So I think you all are aware now anyway, and I don't know any more about the actual scientific results on the studies that are being done on the site than you all do. Um, I just want us to be aware and alert. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I don't know if, is there uh, Dr. Harrison or um, uh, Woodbury Chair, do you have anything to add to that? I'll just say that um, the board uh, did ask us to look at other alternatives and we are, we are pursuing uh, some, some options uh, at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I don't know if Mackenzie had a question. I know she had mentioned something about the nurses, um, the ratio with the nurses, um, which Matt had already uh, pointed out just due to lack of funding um, at a state level where we do not have um, the, the amount of support that we need in the schools. Um, I don't know if there was anything else to add to that. No, it was more just me echoing how like that it, in our county and that's like at the health department, that's something that the school nurses talk about a lot and that they're, they're very frustrated and they're worn down and they're burnt out and all of that stuff. And they're constantly asking when are we getting a new school nurse? Do we have any more school nurses coming? Are there gonna be more positions posted? You know, that's a constant question from them because they're just tired. Um, right, we only employ seven school nurses through the district um, because of funding and the health department and Forsyth County, um, our commissioners have been very supportive of, of closing that gap. Obviously seven is not enough. And um, so we have, uh, nurses through our health department and um, like I said, our county um, local government provide the remaining nurses and they do split schools and uh, we have very few schools with full-time nurses. We uh, in our COVID work group the house actually put forth so it would cost uh, 47 million dollars to have a nurse in every school in North Carolina which is not actually that much in the grand scheme of our budgeting even within the education budget. And so the House put forth in our COVID-19 request a $55 million request for student health, and that would co have covered a nurse in every school, and the Senate was $0. So we ended up only getting $10 million, which is not what we need. But just so you know, $47 million is definitely doable if we were really committing to putting a nurse for every school. And if you are not doing that in a global pandemic, I don't know when you would do it, so. All truth there. <laughs> yeah, um, and Emily Shutt had a question in regards to the curriculum. Emily. Thank you, I had to get myself unmuted. Um, thank you all for your hard work. I. Um, have two kids in elementary school who um, we have taken advantage of the laptops. So thank you for that. We have, you know, every, all the advantages my kids have, but having those extra laptops have been um, crucial to getting work done for both of them. My question is about curriculum. I know we are just, you know, hodgepodging it together for this school year, but looking into next year, moving on to blended um, learning, what, what does it look like for, I mean, I've just spoken to my friends who have multiple kids in the same grade at the same school and their teachers are all doing different things, using different online tools, using different ways of teaching. Sometimes it's live, sometimes it's recorded and just a different classroom, you'd get a different um, experience, which you know is somewhat true to um, regular school. But I was just wondering what kind of uh, leader uh, guidance principals are getting and teachers are getting um, when it comes to e-learning. Thanks. So this, this year we, we engaged in e-learning, but it's actually remote learning. And so a lot of children um, with the Wi-Fi devices could not access the, um, we use Microsoft Teams in the school district and some, um, some uh, um, 
teachers were using Google Hangout and we allowed them to continue that. Um, but, it, but as we transition um, next year, uh, we will be more intentional about teachers remaining on what we call pacing guides and teaching standards uh, using our e-learning model, uh, which will present challenges for children who do not have access or with limited um, technology. So we intend to have technology devices for all children, their own individual devices. Um, but we've got to work on the access because um, children this year, the Department of Instruction uh, guided us through the grading process. And we had a lot of um, flexibility with grading students and their work depending on their ability to complete work. But as we move forward, we will have to be more intentional about the uh, teaching of standards because the grades will have more meaning as we move forward. And so it will look quite different. There will be more face-to-face -face, um, with the blended learning model and less downloading information and sending it back to the teacher. So it will be quite different. Thank you, Dr. Harrison, and um, for that great question. Emily, I know a lot of people um, were asking about that. Um, and so next we have a question for, from uh, Megan Gregory and then um, Camry. Uh, we'll call on you. You can uh, ask your question afterwards. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to say thanks to those who organized this and to all who have taken their time to, to share this great information. I've learned a lot and it's been really helpful. Um, my question is about um, the uh, outreach to parents of students who have not been engaging with the online learning. So I'm really glad to hear that there's kind of that level of grassroots engagement. And I have two specific questions. One about how that's being done. So are existing staff being trained to do that? Are you hiring um, uh, kind of parent liaisons like from those communities? Um, or how is that working? And then the second question is about um, support to families whose primary language is not English and how that is being addressed. Thank you. So really all of the above, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we, you know, this was a first for us uh, in, in the way that, that it happened. And we began to monitor the number of students who were logging onto devices using the Wi-Fi devices that we, we were able to provide. We began to survey teachers uh, daily to see if students were turned, you know, if they turned in work, um, teachers were calling homes and those kinds of things. So <clears throat> once we could pretty much um, gauge over about a two week period that students were not responding. Uh, they went into a database and we've been able to um, um, code those students and map those students. Uh, so Chair Woodbury just texted me if we could um, post that information and we will. So we have by street um, the students in the households that have not engaged um, not the entire time. Some students would engage once a week and those kinds of things, but we actually have a mapping system that uh, allowed us to see that. So now that we know the neighborhoods, uh, you know, with the stay at home, it was really difficult and without um, really proper training to send social workers out to homes. And they did want to go, but we at some point had to cease their work. But once that order is lifted, our intent is to uh, use our resources to start to work in those communities. How that looks, this is a first for us, so we're not really sure. Uh, we have Effie McMillan working with our task force. Um, we've had many, many offers from the uh, Parks and Recreation Center, from United Way, from our Minister's Alliance, and, and people saying, you know, we want to help. We had a grant from our Black uh, Entrepreneurial Institute members of $10,000 to provide support. So the CARES dollars that were, were provided to school districts across the state was for the purpose of advancing e-learning. And so we intend to combine some dollars and efforts to get out to those communities and start to work with children. Uh, a lot of it is access but a lot of it is, is the parents and, and the circumstances. We had children who were keeping, who were babysitting other children, could not engage. We had children who actually went to work. Um, they were able to secure jobs and went to work. We had children that just decided not to engage. There was a variety of reasons. So we've got to get out to those homes 
And um, when I taught school, I was a homebound teacher. I went from house to house to house. And so we have to get out to homes and go to, from home to home and teach parents what this blended learning model looks like. Um, and so those are things that we're gonna have to work on uh, in, a, in a big way. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Harrison. And so, uh, Camry. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Camry uh, Wilborn, and I work at Wake Forest um, in our community engagement office. Um, and I have been working um, this spring to manage our tutoring and mentoring programs. Um, and we were able to move some of those online to a virtual setting, um, but we're starting to plan for the fall now. And so, my question is, um, where is the district kind of leaning as it relates to, to volunteers in the school um, in the fall? Um, and if we are leaning towards, you know, halting um, outside volunteers from coming in, what is the kind of process for virtual volunteer engagement? We really can't say. Um, it depends on the state of, of affairs at that time. Uh, we know that we will have a screening process. And before we um, departed, we did uh, limit, we, we actually um, uh, limited access to our children only from parents and through the, the, the nurse's office. So it really depends on where we are with, um, with COVID at that time before we can really make a determination. Thank you. And thank you for all the work that you're doing, Camry. Um, Camry, the work that she's doing at Wake Forest, um, she's definitely a great partner as well. And I'm glad you're, you're on this evening. And so next we have a question from Katie. Yes, hi, this question is probably for Dr. Harrison. I've had several friends with kids ask me, you know, what they should do for next year, if it's better to have their, you know, if there becomes an option to send kids to school or to keep them home for e-learning, if they should do one or the other, what's most helpful to you all as a school district. They've asked me if um, they should consider homeschooling. And I've said, no, the district needs your money. <laughs> and then you get that per student money. Um, and if you're going to homeschool, you might as well have somebody else doing the lesson plans. But yeah. do you have any advice for what those of us, you know, a lot of moms in the community are talking about it right now, what we can do to be partners with you all, but also um, be most helpful to you all? Because we know some students really need to be at school. Um, and for those of us who do have an option, what is most helpful? You know, it's hard to give advice. Uh, what we can do is give options. And so again, you know, the board has uh, given us permission to pursue a virtual academy uh, so that parents who so choose uh, can, will continue the e-learning model. It'd be a little different though. It'd be more face-to-face -face and more instruction, of course. Uh, so that will be an option uh, for children. And, 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 and it's not that some parents are electing not to send their children to school because of fear. Or Some parents actually have children with compromised immune systems and really cannot uh, afford to send their children to school unless they feel that the, the environment is 100% free of, of opportunities as much as possible. We know it's never 100%. Uh, and, and if you've ever been an elementary principal, you know that uh, elementary school children spend all their time trying to spread their germs of love. And so um, uh, we're, I think the Board of Education will hear a presentation from, from, from my team. And I, from all indications, they are on board with opportunities. And so we would just want to be available for parents as they make decisions. We don't want to try to influence you one way or the other. We just want to have opportunities for you and your child to remain in the Forsyth um, school system um, and, and uh, be successful. Okay, and I know Josh had a quick follow-up question to that. Yes, uh, thanks everyone for participating tonight. This has been so informative and incredible to learn all this information. Um, I think going off what Katie just asked, my big question is, um, kind of like what Emily said earlier, my kids have also definitely benefited from having access to the um, Chromebooks provided by the school because this happened so last minute, just kind of all the resources that we've been able to avail, our, avail ourselves of has been very helpful. But I'm wondering for next year, you know, as someone, I'm just very conscious of, of not wanting to take more money or take more funding or resources from the school when there's not enough resources to go around it. And so I'm wondering if there's specific areas that perhaps me and other families can be thinking of in terms of 
maybe purchases that we can be making in anticipation of next year just to help minimize the financial hit to the school district so that those dollars can be spent elsewhere? Well, I will say that if you decide to participate in virtual learning, we do maintain our student um, FTE, and that's a positive for us. If you um, go the homeschool route, of course, we lose um, those dollars for students. So we're not doing trying that. To, if you're trying to make a decision, you're not homeschooling, but if you're no. trying to make a decision, it would help. It would help our school to maintain, you know, all that we have to do. Um, if you if you did elect a virtual. Uh, coming to school, uh, it remains to be seen. We'll try to communicate as soon as possible. Uh, we're waiting on, um, you know, uh, some direction and guidance from uh, various uh, leaders throughout the state uh, on how we need to address. So we'll, we'll be in touch, though. We'll okay. have clear directions for families uh, as we transition to the fall. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And. Um, and, and Eunice, I'm coming to you, but I just wanted to ask um, Representative Clemens, um, that, was there anything that you wanted to add on to this um, conversation uh, just in regards to the, the funding? And I know a lot of us who support public education, you know, we, we are nervous because we know that um, in, in a lot of ways, it seems like there's a war on it. <laughs> so is there anything that you would like to add or Representative Terry? Um, I, I would say that actually Matt brought to us a few weeks ago a concern that has now bubbled up more and more that we do our school funding, which is um, what your superintendent was talking about, based on the students in a seat on the 20th day of school. That's the average daily membership, and that's how we allocate funding. And that might be quite problematic if we have significant, uh, you know, large numbers of families or particular areas of our community where um, people feel vulnerable, don't want their children to go to school, if we all of a sudden have a spike for some reason in Winston-Salem the second week of October and you don't have kids, I mean, so we have started to look at what some alternatives are for funding, but not based on ADM. Um, but I do think that's going to be something for us to all keep our eye on um, because whatever alternatives we come up with, we want to make sure they are appropriate and that they um, do not hold school systems at fault with funding decisions. We want to make sure that they are appropriate and that they um, do not hold school systems at fault with funding It's fun to hear myself in surround sound. <laughs> so I, I, Matt's looked into that at the national level a little bit, I know, but um, I do think it's something for us to pay attention to. Thank you for that. Um, and I believe that Eunice had a question. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, thank you and um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my question is around the uh, funding for Ashley School, the new school. Uh, are we talking about uh, the actual building of the school uh, and where is that funding going to come from? Are we talking about another school bond? Because I know that HUD only has two years to use the 30 million in the development of housing. And how is that gonna uh, affect or be, or is it, an issue at all as, as far as uh, the actual construction of the school. So with the last, with the last, I'm sorry. With the last, okay. uh, with this bond that we're in now, um, it is budgeted, uh, the design dollars are budgeted. And I, I believe it's close to $900,000 is budgeted for design. Uh, the property and building itself was not in this uh, bond. Um, in this particular bond. And so um, with some other savings uh, from other projects, we were able to go to our county commission and ask permission to move those savings to the land purchase. And so right now it is in the process of, um, we're looking at the land purchase in that area. Then comes the design, which usually takes about a year or so. 
and the building itself would need to either come from uh, capital dollars from the state uh, budget or it would need to go in the next bond. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harrison. So we're talking about 2024-26. It would go, yes, in the next, in the 2024 bond, I believe it would go in the next bond. But once you do a, have a purchase and you get into the design work again, that's about a year or two down the road. And um, so that's not as far away as you think it is. Uh, and if there were other dollars to come through um, with state capital improvement dollars, then the board could vote um, to use those dollars for construction. But that has not, um, we have not had a state budget passed, so we, we, we don't know if, if that would be possible or not at this time. So right now, it would be uh, waiting on the bond. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, Emily Shutt had a question um, for you, Matt, and she wanted to know what are the changes on the Leandro timeline due to COVID? It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> it's already been pushed back a few times in terms of the court case and when the state's plan is due. Um, I think what's hard is it's not just up to the one judge that we know we've got courts across the state that have had to shut down over the past few months because they're just obviously places where people are gathering and a lot of them that kept going were kind of rough places to be, to be honest. So there's a backlog across cases. Um, and this one, since it's sort of a bigger constitutional case, is one that doesn't necessarily go to the front of the line, you know, when you're talking about people getting evicted and, you know, people having things happening, that, you know, domestic violence and those sorts of things that are happening that are super immediate in their lives. So at any rate, we don't know. I mean, we think it'll be the deadline as far as we know is still the end of this month. But if there are further kind of across the board delays in the court proceedings, that could get pushed out. And the deadline is that's for the state to submit its plan to comply with the rec recommendations put in Westhead. So then the judge would still have to have some sort of hearing where that got approved. It doesn't have to be in person necessarily. So that would come a little bit later. So we don't really know. It looks like at it, any way you look at it, we already have the bill filing deadline and things and the legis legislators have put in a few bills 1129 and 30 that relate to Leandro. I think they were in a tough spot trying to get those bills in without knowing exactly what was going to be in the state's plan that they could make it correspond with. Um, but it certainly is a start. I think realistically, it pushes back the timeline. And the, 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 because we we're talking about putting about $800 million into public education in year one in order to get on the path of compliance, that's not going to happen. It doesn't, I mean, it's hard to see that. And so, whatever, you know, the timeline itself, in my opinion, if we can avoid cuts and make investments in some of the really critical areas like disadvantaged student supplemental fund, funding for children with disabilities, things that direct the most funding to the most at risk kids, um, that's gonna be a win. And then we sort of start the clock over and begin to try to make some of these much bigger, more aspirational investments next year and over the next eight years. So I know that's not really an answer because we're, we're in an era of a lot of delays and. A lot of uncertainty about trying to figure anything out and, and that's sort of big and small, I guess. Um, and, and Leandra is one of those things that's a little hard to tell. Thank you, Matt. And um, at and um, Representative Clemens just posted that um, that sh that they have filed a bill for the statewide bond um, and is asking for us to advocate for that. So I would like for you just to share some information about that. And then also, I just have a question. Um, we ha have a question that came in in regards to getting funding for some of our critical needs now from other sources. Um, as Matt just shared, you know, we're looking at now pushing back um, this case uh, just due to COVID-19. So, you know, what are some other models or what other areas should we explore um, when it comes to getting some of the needs funded? So I guess, Ashton, I don't know if you could touch on both, um, but certainly the uh, statewide bill. Sure. So, um, and I will put, Margaret just asked for the bill numbers. So after I finish talking, I'll look those up. So people have the numbers if they want to help us advocate. So one is we did do a statewide bond that's 3.9 billion. Um, I want to say 2.5 or 6 is would be for K-12. It also includes some for our higher education institutions. 
uh, and it matches or mirrors what was put forth by Governor Cooper in last year's session. Um, and so last year, the House actually did put forth a budget that approved through the House. The Senate would not agree to it but it was about half what Governor Cooper put forth. So we put forth like the full with Governor Cooper. And then we also, um, I'll put all three of these bill numbers. We also filed, with, which Matt helped us with, uh, two Leandro um, comprehensive bills. One is invest in a sound basic education. The other is ensure a sound basic education. They are invest is an appropriations bill and sure is a mostly policy bill but they are reasonable things that we think should be happening for the first steps to our commitment on leandro we cannot say oh well there's too much going on we're just not going to work on that this year and so the house caucus worked hard with our partners in ncae the governor's office matt and the justice center to put forward some reasonable first steps for our commitment to leandre so i'll put all those bill numbers in the chat and we would love any advocacy and either late we are matt and i are going to be on a call later this week so we can start to work on a press rollout for the leandre bills and so we can circle back with you guys um, to if you would like to participate with that um, as we're working on building advocacy for those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we'll um, if you could post those bills and definitely include us in your efforts um, of, of mobilizing around this. Yeah, and I don't know, Matt, if there was anything you wanted to add. That was great. I mean, I would just in terms of kind of other models or how do we kind of get through this period where we know there's going to be less funding available at the state level. I mean, I think it is one excuse the legislators I think have used that is fair is that we don't really know yet what all of the repercussions will be in terms of our state funding, but we are getting a lot and how it'll interact with the federal funding. So I would say the goal we have should be I mean, the, the purpose of some of this federal funding is to do this sort of thing, to carry us through. As well. There's a lot of pieces to it, but there's a lot, there's money in education. And we've tried to figure out, you know, is there enough there or would there, if there was further federal action, could we fill some of these state level holes? So yeah, well, we're going to have some, we might have state level cuts. We would say that we need to be able to fill, they can't be sort of larger in magnitude than the amount that's being filled by the federal money and that they also can't be permanent. That was the thing during the last recession was that we got a lot of help from the federal government to carry us through the, 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 the Great Recession in 2008, but then we left those funding levels where they were at and never filled them back in when the federal money went away. So that's what I would say needs to happen here, that we might be able to get by with some of that kind of support for a period of time, but we can't just freeze in the levels. Otherwise, we'd really be free, we'd be taking like a recession level from last time, freezing it there, then dropping it down another level for another recession and freezing it there, basically. And we can't do that. Um, so I think the strategy should be to, you know, just at least kind of hold the line for now and then begin to reinvest without losing the kind of baseline of state funding out that's out there. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Reverend Ford. But just before I do, I did want to, um, Matt, you just said, hold the line, you know. Um, and, and so just with that, um, Charlotte, I'm wondering if there's anything that you can share or even just stress the importance um, of just the community resources coming together to figure out what we can do, um, if you will, as we look to hold the line, um, you know, for the time being as we continue to fight at a state level. Uh, but I know that we've had different conversations. I know that a lot of the foundations are stepping up, trying to figure out what role they can play um, into getting things done. Um, but is there anything that you would like to add to that? You know, I would, I would speak to what I mentioned earlier, which is, um, you know, there's a role for all of us to play. Um, I'm, I'm currently, I'll be participating in a meeting on Friday I know someone mentioned earlier in the conversation around um, eliminating what we're calling the digital divide. And the Winston-Salem Foundation, uh, Layla Gorms will be convening a conversation with some um, area organizations and groups to talk about how we work together as a community to eliminate um, the issue around um, having access to broadband 
in our community, uh, particularly for the children, but also for families as we move further into and experience the impact of COVID-19. And so uh, my hope is that through this conversation, we'll identify some ways that we can work together to address that issue, whether it's through pulling together a um, agenda, a policy agenda that addresses how we advocate uh, for access in that regard, or um, also talking more about um, you know, what it will call, calls, uh, or call for for us to work together to identify additional resources and way of technology and supporting the school system in that regard. Um, in addition to that, um, I would say that you know, there's an opportunity, as Cameron mentioned, through your volunteerism that we can support the schools in way of tutoring and mentoring. Um, and then also just coming together again to identify what other resources that uh, the community has that we can then leverage to support our children and um, involve, you know, getting involved with to also co-develop uh, co strategies and, and ways that we can then address gaps that still exist. Um, I know I was speaking earlier with um, Paula McCoy with p for p and she mentioned that she's working also with a, a neighborhood organization and that's um, embedded invested for East Winston and that they'd come up with a lot of great ideas that they're interested in moving forward. And so again, it takes all of us coming together to share our ideas and, and devise ways that we um, can implement and improve the quality of education for all our children. So um, I can't stress enough, it takes all of us working together. Very good, thank you so much. And you know, Representative Clemens, I, I know I speak for the entire board of A4E, you can expect our full support on these uh, state bonds, particularly relative to money for a new Ashley school, four years is too long to wait. Uh, we were saying a couple of years ago, not another break, not another bond. So um, if there's anything we can do to help expedite that process at the state level and try to get some state money, even in the midst of everything we're going to be dealing with financially because of the fallout from COVID-19, uh, you just let us know how we can help. All right. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone who has joined us tonight. I do need to make a few particular acknowledgments to our fearless leader, uh, Kelly P. Easton, our Executive Director of a for e our Director of Communications and Grants, Mary Pat Thomas, all of our board members, including Katie Simon Lee, our VP, Emily Shutt, Dr. Willett Nash, Dr. Josh Zizo, Ed Bell, uh, Eunice Campbell, and the light bulb, Ricky Johnson, who is doctoral intern to the board. Also want to recognize all of our advocacy partners, Amy Archambault, Mark Madrigal, Russ May, Faith in the City, Reed Winston-Salem, Love Out Loud, the Center of Excellence for Elimination of Health Disparities for Sight Promise, Every Child in North Carolina, and our two primary local grantors, KB Reynolds Charitable Trust and Winston-Salem Foundation. So the simple theme for tonight was reimagining advocacy now more than ever. I think we've done a pretty comprehensive job of covering uh, the landscape of issues that we are dealing with and those that have become more acute and even that have emerged new uh, in the current landscape relative to coronavirus. So we've got a whole lot of work to do and we just want to turn our attention now towards that work and towards working together in greater partnership because we can always do more together than we can apart. So do be sure to go on our website to Action for Ashley, Action for Equity, excuse me, uh, winstonsalem.org um, and check out our response to COVID-19 petition. We do ask you to sign that and find other ways that you can uh, get involved, including making donations financially to the organization, as well as joining one of our advocacy teams. So with that, we thank you once again to all of our presenters. Thank you for your insight, your contributions, and the time that you've spent. And we'll see you again soon. God bless you. Thank you.